so what is the basic difference between electroosmosis and electrokinetic movement okay so electrokinetics uh, is uh, a broad term which includes uh, transport of fluids and mass mm -hmm. by uh, applying external electric field so electroosmosis is, is you can say a sub branch of electrokinetics okay. yeah so you can by applying field you can uh, transport both ions and fluids so the process of motion of fluid due to electric field is called electroosmosis yeah and uh, uh, when you were talking about that h filter which is like yes. uh, without membrane so it's like if we think of a simple situation ki where you have a denser particle or a lighter particle even if you like leave it in uh, randomly yes. so they do form uh, certain zones matlab i'm not f able to frame my questions directly so like what is exactly why do we need a h filter yeah so his question is that Uh, you know even in other uh, uh, let's say uh, i'll give you an example so let's say you have uh, 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 let's say you have a mixture of ink and some uh, let's say protein for example or ink and let's say some nanoparticles okay you would uh, think uh, you would know that you know ink would uh, have higher diffusivity so you take a glass full of water and carefully Uh, put this mixture of ink and these nanoparticles okay uh, on this uh, uh, in on the top layer of uh, the water and uh, you would you can imagine that uh, the ink would diffuse and over time will fill this whole glass but uh, the particles the larger particles with lower diffusivity are not going to fill the channel then you can collect the top fluid okay so this is exactly the same thing but you're doing it in a continuous fashion Yeah. Is and there a, precisely because is there a time constraint when we do use this uh, h layer wala yeah see uh, if you construct a h filter okay which has uh, a long uh, channel in which you have these parallel streams so if you get give sufficient time uh, for uh, both species to diffuse eventually you will have a uniform mixture so we want to cut that length at that particular point where one species has diffused and other has not and then collect only the streams which have a higher diffusing species so you choose your length based on the differential diffusivities of the species which we are trying to uh, separate out okay so certainly if you have a very long uh, channel both uh, the high and low diffusivity species would mix and this this will not work okay Um, what are the typical number associated with length and width in practical situations to keep the the sparsely number high? Uh, the practical number high. Mm. The width is about, uh, or you can say the diameter of the channel is about hundred microns, and we choose this because, as you know, Reynolds number depends upon the diameter of the channel. So we want well, uh, precise, uh, well controlled. flow precise flow with no non linearities and chaotic mixing so you need to reduce the reynolds number okay the ratio of inertial to the viscous forces so that's why we choose the dimension which is really small at which the viscous forces become important so the width you can say depends uh, we choose to uh, have low reynolds number and the length would be uh, let's say few millimeters okay so and you need to change um if your solute or solvent is different yeah certainly yeah so uh, these are not uh, like ba uh, basic pipetting you can use them for different processes but you need to know the application to actually uh, uh, device uh, make a device okay so for example in the example of sperm and non motile sperm okay it depends upon the diffusivity of the species which you are trying to analyze So my question was about the materials that these microfluidic devices are made of. So can you tell us um, what kind of materials they are? Are they inexpensive? Are they toxic? Yeah. So that's a uh, good uh, question. So uh, when this field started uh, uh, in the beginning of this field, so the techniques of microfabrication was was were borrowed from uh, microelectronics because that was well established. And I told you earlier that uh, the dimensions are not as small as what you would need. in microelectronics so the big in beginning you could uh, create chips on a silicon wafer just by etching so the disadvantage is that it does uh, you don't have optical access if you have a silicon chip okay and most of 
the times we are using uh, fluorescence based detection. But you can use the, those same etching, wet etching techniques on a glass uh, substrate. So, uh, and glass is uh, good because you know we know that it is inert and most of the chemistry and uh, bio, uh, biochemistry applications uh, are, are the uh, assays are well developed for uh, for glass based uh, you know let's say beakers and pipettes so initially people started off uh, by using glass and we still use glass microfluidic chips but the thing is that uh, if you want to reduce the cost, so you need to make these uh, devices at a lower cost. And one application of microfluidics is in make, uh, developing point of care devices. So certainly you can't use these uh, chips which are for one-time use uh, for practical applications because you won't want to contaminate with a different sample. And uh, it's not like uh, your processor or uh, IC where you can use it multiple times. So this is one time use. So this uh, wet etching process is not the right way of doing it. So you would actually move on to plastics. Uh, so uh, using a method called injection molding by which uh, all of the plastic and uh, materials you, uh, devices that you see around or products you see around are made by injection molding. So you can uh, use injection molding and people uh, for commercial uh, devices, people would eventually, and for low cost uh, applications, people use uh, plastic uh, this, uh, devices. For prototyping, you can do, let's say, CNC uh, milling on a plastic substrate. And that, uh, see, injection molding, uh, the cost will go down if you make uh, these devices in bulk. So you can go down to really low cost, like $1, if you make uh, large amounts of, let's say, tens of thousands of these uh, chips. Okay, so your, for example, your uh, ball pen is really cheap, right? Few rupees. Okay, but if you had to machine that uh, ballpoint pen, the you know outer casing, it would be expensive. But because it is being produced in bulk, you can reduce the cost. Okay, so you can do it in uh, plastics. Okay, for prototyping, people can also use. Uh, elastomeric materials like PDMS, okay, uh, it's, a, it's like a rubber, okay, polydimethyl siloxane. So with the process called soft lithography, you can make channels, but uh, you can't use them for commercial applications because that material uh, has its limitations, you, you know, gases can diffuse into it and uh, it is not inert to certain kind of solvents. So uh, I think for commercialization eventually, uh, uh, the way to go forward is by using plastic chips. Okay. Recently, people uh, have started. Uh, there's a uh, group of uh, researchers who think that they can do it on paper as well. So recently, people have thought of doing it on paper. So in our lab, for example, what we do is we take this filter paper, we print wax patterns on it using a printer, a commercial printer, wax printer. Okay. Uh, which is actually for colored printing, okay, printing photographic, uh, printing photographs. And then you put it on a hot plate and then the wax goes into this and you get channels. So if you put dye, for example, like this, so it will follow that precise path. But uh, for some applications, it might be good, but you know, uh, not for all applications. So I would, in my opinion, I think plastics is the way to go for commercializing uh, this. Uh, technology and making low cost devices. To what extent uh, are these applications for research and to what applications are, uh, to what extent are they for actual diagnostics in hospitals? Yeah, so uh, as I, I gave you three examples of commercialized devices and these are, this is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list, it's, uh, these are applications which I know of and eventually you just tell what you actually know. So. Uh, so one application, as I showed you, was for an uh, for IVF treatment. You can select a sperm, okay. And in uh, I think there's there's a company called Abbott, which has a device for doing some tests in uh, operation theaters, which is based on uh, microfluidics. And uh, there are new companies that are uh, coming up, okay. Even for electrophoresis in Netherlands, there's a uh, company which is developing a handheld device. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the applications which they have shown is to monitor the dose of lithium for p 
patients, psychiatric patients, in so they, you can put a drop of blood and monitor the amount of uh, dose of lithium that you are being given. Similarly, you can, uh, they have I think also showed application on monitoring uh, the calcium and magnesium content in cow milk, for example. So these uh, applications are coming up, but uh, most successful ones are those which are high-end applications like sequencing, for example, you know, uh, because they are more commercially viable rather than making a low cost. Yeah, so you mentioned an interesting thing that uh, to uh, an application to measure the adulteration of milk. Yes, so since that's quite a rampant problem uh, in the country, what is uh, your guess as to whether there can be like a really low cost uh, device that let's say all villages, all towns and cities can deploy. So, you know, you, you buy your milk and uh, you measure how good or bad it is. Yeah, I don't know if you can do it. I mean, you can make it make a device where you can do it yourself kind oh, of I test, see. but you can uh, and uh, uh, back at Stanford, we had uh, worked on a device where we had integrated and this ITP and electrophoresis on a handheld device, which was powered from a USB. Uh, port of the computer for, of laptop because although you need high fields, you need very uh, low power, so very low current. So you can do that. I think uh, 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 in past these technologies were not commercialized because of certain blocking patents by the uh, initial pioneers in this field and I think now this field is opening up more and you'll be able to uh, use these technologies. So uh, if, I mean See, all these tests which, you know, you uh, do it uh, by taking samples to the lab, eventually you, they use the same uh, processes but on a lab scale or on a benchtop uh, systems. You can certainly reduce their sizes and, uh, but I think the bottleneck was the, uh, the intellectual property and I think uh, it's a good time to actually start developing these devices because uh, the field is now mature. Uh, it's almost 15, 20 years since uh, the initial uh, intellectual property uh, uh, people uh, ha uh, made this intellectual property. So I, I believe that in coming years we'll have more of these devices. So there's no te technological uh, bottleneck. It was legal bottleneck, I guess. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, when you detect, say, like in biology, uh, protein concentrations at absolute small, I mean, at a micro scale, what are the what are the error rates? Hmm. Okay. So uh, uh, let's. Uh, so your question is like, uh, what is the uncertainty in uh, doing this and uh, doing these experiments or? Uh, like there's uh, yeah the sensi not the sensitivity exactly the uh, accuracy of the test i mean what are the, what would be the error rates of doing it at such a small scale yeah so uh, i'll give you an example of itp for example so eventually you draw a sample from uh, uh, from your lab okay so you take a tiny amount of that sample and uh, these techniques ensure that uh, uh, without any uh, uncertainties, okay, uh, you can let's say concentrate all of it, okay. And uh, given the fact that uh, at small scales external uh, variations in in environment are not going to affect that, uh, the uncertainty is actually quite low, okay. So, for example, uh, let's say the system, you know, the flow at small scales is. Uh, uh, immune to what's happening around, okay, because it's highly viscous and you can do things more precisely at smaller scales than at larger scales. So your uncertainty would certainly uh, be less than what you get at large uh, scales. Okay, yes. And uh, for example, in, uh, in uh, let's say digital PCR, for example, so you are trying to reduce the background. The signal is the same, you're trying to reduce the background, so you're getting better sensitivity. So uh, there is a uh, plot between PCR cycle and fluorescence yes. and um, if we observe the green and red curve, yes. it, it splits after a certain value of PCR cycle. Yes. After that, uh, for one value of PCR cycle, 
it is having two values of fluorescence so physically yeah, i is, want to yeah this is just an example let's say you you know your targets you had about 15 and 16 different targets so initially the curves are going to resemble okay if you look from far away and eventually you know as your gain is increasing over the number of cycles you will be able to see the difference okay so it's can I have two different values of fluorescence no certainly you can't have two maybe in, from different repeats you can have two fluorescence but in the same experiment you know uh, you can't have different fluorescence so uh, this schematic uh, i think it just shows that you know if you have small difference in and uh, this uh, uh, the initial number of dna fragments you won't be able to detect over time you will be able to detect so at that this particular threshold that i'm showing uh, you are not able to detect the difference why is it happening for these two curves only no no this is just a schematic it's a cartoon this uh, it's not actual data with this i would like to thank you for your kind attention